Hi, everyone. Well, Kathy and I got some time to talk this morning. We did. On TV, but on TV, you have to cram everything into six minutes. <laughs> so we can kind of pick up where we left off. And also, I now get the benefit of listening to some very smart people. Um, Absolutely. To steal, to steal some of their questions. And so that's where I want to start, actually. We had Alex Rampal up here with Andreessen Horowitz um, talking about the importance of distribution and experience. And it makes me think back to our conversation this morning right. about the Apple Goldman credit card. Um, you know, it's, the reviews have been mixed. No one's been very, very excited about it. And you yourself said this morning that everything it's doing, we've seen before. But when you talk about the experience and the distribution, isn't this what sets this card apart? Especially when you're talking about a huge market of millennials and Generation Zs that don't have credit cards in the same way as older generations. Yeah, well, I would have loved if Alex had answered that question, actually, because all I can do here is look defensive. But, <laughs> but I do believe, actually, that um, uh, there are a couple of new things here. Uh, product capability and, and um, credit capability on a mobile device is not new. Most of us in the room have our credit cards in the Apple wallet today. What I actually am a little bit excited about, about the announcement, so in terms of competitive pressure, uh, you know, all the power to them. Um, we've got a lot of great relationships and we'll continue to work hard at that. But I am, I do think it's interesting that there's an offer of a, an additional set of rewards for use of the mobile wallet as opposed to an actual card swipe. One of the big issues in the is around mobility and payment using mobility is customer adoption and merchant adoption. And the idea that um, Apple would be in the business of encouraging adoption overall actually can only be good news for all of us. Um, does it surprise you? I remember I was at another tech conference a few years ago, and there was a lot of big tech names there. Um, less and less so as scrutiny has increased. It seemed at one point like big tech might be the biggest threat to traditional banking. Um, you think about an Amazon that has all of your payment data already, 100 million prime subscribers. How do you think of that now? Is it all partnerships, or do you think that they still represent sort of a threat to what you do, especially when we talk about the Apple Goldman card? The credit card is just one thing. Is that going to open up a world for Apple and Goldman Sachs, which is just starting out its consumer banking business, to take some of your customers or customers that you could be searching for? Well, I actually thought the conversation with Randall was very interesting. In 2001, we said the same thing about the telcos. Mm -hmm. so, so this notion of, of different industries disrupting banking is not new. I, think, I, I do think the juxtaposition of, of entrepreneurial um, um, engines versus distribution and relationship is the right just juxtaposition. We can say we have distribution, we can say we have relationships, but we have to be super smart about ensuring that, that when we do see innovation that's ahead of us, that we find great ways to partner or buy from those innovators, and that we, are, we enjoy and benefit from our customer relationships, but we're not slow to, to, to um, accomplish that same innovation. Right. As Bank of America's chief technology officer, are you talking to the big tech companies? Is this Apple partnership something that you think Bank of America would have liked to do? Did you talk to Apple throughout it all? Well, I don't know for sure if we talked to Apple or not. Again, we are one of the first adopters of Apple Pay, and, and our card sits atop of the Apple wallet in, for many and most, I would argue, of our, of our customers. And again, many banks in the room have the, have the same, uh, same thing that they can say. Um, it, again, the, the biggest issue in the, in the mobile payment space is adoption. So to, to the extent that it becomes ubiquitous, then it's on us to win with relationships. And, and I'd have to believe that that's our core competency. I would advocate that as our, our core competency. And it's a, it's a game we're willing uh, to, and, and, in, and not only willing to uh, compete openly in, but to invest in aggressively. We talked a little bit about Amazon earlier, and you know, as a tech reporter sitting here, you ask almost every startup, are they scared of Amazon? Does it keep them up at night? And I asked you the same question this morning, Kathy, in terms of payments. They have everyone's data. They're going into online lending. Um, you can see how they would turn on the spigots if they wanted to, to become a bigger player in fintech. Why do you think they haven't? And does it worry you that they could? Uh, it doesn't keep me up at night, but I'm not silly enough to not be worried, right? I, I do think, I, I would juxtapose it this way, transaction focus, um, the focus on an individual retail product sale with um, 
a, a relationship that involves trust, that involves a broad range of services that go way beyond transactions, and, uh, and what our customers rely on in terms of moments that are so important to them that who helps them execute against their dreams it makes all the difference. You know, it's one thing to buy a product, it's another thing to trust someone with a decision to buy a home. Uh, it's another one thing to buy a product, it's another thing to trust someone with your investable assets, the thing you've worked so hard to create, the thing you hope is gonna take you through retirement. Again, can't rest on the laurel of relationships, but I do think the business model is fundamentally different, transactions versus relationships. And so you mentioned trust a few times, and I know we want to get to that. Do you think that people trust banks more than they do the tech companies, especially in the current environment when tech is seeing a lot of the backlash in terms of privacy and data? I think two th things are true. Number one, I think they do. Uh, and I think that uh, we are all in the trust business and have been in the sand, since the sands of time. The other thing I think is that we've been highly regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, also since the sands of time and so to the extent that a, an individual consumer might have a worry they are backstopped by a very ardent uh, very well established set of regulations that that cover everything from data and privacy to how we make lending and credit decisions in, including by the way how we operate as fiduciaries in our advice and counsel roles Right, and that amount of data is growing. We talked a little bit, there was this uh, announcement this morning that Equifax and FICO are gonna be selling more data to banks. And so as you, not specifically Bank of America, but as banks in general buy this data, how focused are you? And so far, it's been really interesting. We talked about this in the newsroom. So far, the backlash against privacy regulation has focused on big tech companies like Facebook and Google. Do you think it's going to turn to banking? And you know, you said that there's regulations and different histories. Do you think that banking's sort of immune from this, especially when you do have these data breaches and you're collecting more and more information? I don't think we're immune at all. I think we're at a different point in the maturity cycle. Here in California alone, we've operated um, under the most aggressive privacy and privacy notification rules that exist anywhere in the country. So, so we've been at this uh, for a while and in, in a different point in the maturity cycle. Cycle. Um, you know, I was thinking a lot about the regulation discussion after we talked this morning. In many ways, what, what we think about it doesn't matter. That ship has sailed here in the United States. And so the question is how to, um, how to ensure we get the right regulation without valueless complexity in the mix. And that will be true across all sectors. And I also think it ma level playing fields do matter. If a company collects data, regardless of whether it's a bank or a tech company, we should operate in a level playing field. If we make loans, regardless of whether or not it's a fintech company or an established financial institution, the, the playing field should be level there based on, on the activity that we're undertaking. Now we started with Megatech, talking about Apple, Amazon. Um, going a step down, let's talk about the PayPals and Squares of the world. Um, how closely are you watching these companies and the innovation that they're doing and, to be honest, the encroachment that they're starting to do on the traditional banking sector. Well, we work with them in many, in many mm -hmm. situations. So, um, yes, we watch. Uh, when, we want, when we think it's appropriate, we invest. When we think it's appropriate, we buy from companies like this. And we work to make the e ecosystem work from a customer's perspective in. So I'm focused on partnership. I'm focused on, on how we buy from fintech companies. But I care most about how that, what happens when we meet the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, because they, our customers want to hit send. Our customers uh, want, want to know that a payment is being processed. Th they don't care what happens in the ecosystem behind them. So the, the important thing for us is to do it brilliantly um, um, in terms of execution, error free, uh, to do it as fast as, as humanly or digitally possible, and to do it in a, in a safe way. When you look at, let's say, an example of Venmo versus Zelle, why did it take so long for the banks? I know they've been doing P2P forever, but to get it together and come together and have it branded under Zelle when Venmo existed for so many years, when you talk about innovation, why would that take so long, especially when 
um, traditional banks were already doing this kind of P2P payments. Well, the vision of Zelle is very different. The vision of Zelle was to create something with a very large number of financial institutions and then make it available to all financial institutions. That is a, a very different model than we have an individual capability and we'll sell it or use it to anyone who wants it on a one-off basis. The vision of Zelle was to create a, a new ecosystem with a wide range of partners. So, so, um, so it starts fundamentally there. And to create a big vision sometimes does take time. And you know, I, this is an issue I talk a lot about at home. I have a 19-year-old and a 23-year-old, and they are hooked on Venmo. I might as well just <laughs> say that out loud. They're hooked on Venmo, except I found a way, which is I'm not going to send you any money unless you Smart. get it on Zelle. <laughs> Zelle. So you know, um, and imagine that they can use Zelle now. Uh, well, it's amazing the numbers, right? Because yeah. Zelle sort of it started, and all of a sudden they had all of these millions of users because it already existed in your banking account. Um, but in this case, and going back to the discussion with Alex and Mark, um, the your innovation versus distribution, right? They had the distribution, and by the time you guys turned on the innovation, it looks, the banks, by you I say the banks, turned on the innovation. There was still enough time, but when it comes to other products, and let me ask you, is there anything that PayPal and Square are doing that you feel like maybe the banks missed out on, or Bank of America? should have done. Well, I told you my story this morning. You know, in North Carolina, you can only buy fireworks on the 4th of July, right? Because I don't know why, but it's true. Uh, we're very forward <laughs> in North Carolina. Uh, and the first time I ever saw Square being used was when I pulled over on the side of the road many years ago and tried to buy some fireworks. And I sat there in that moment and said, we may have missed something here. I've had very few moments in my career where I've actually thought that, but I will say in that moment, I did have that concern that maybe we missed something. Now, the issue has been... Um, been and you're talking about the dongle. The dongle, which is such a little part the, of what they do today. Um, exactly, but has led to everything else that they do. It got, them, got people into their ecosystem. It allowed them to offer services, make loans to small businesses. And now they're moving upstream, by the way. Well, and it, it did something else very important. It took the payment away from the point of sale to the point of the hand, right? Because you could, you could swipe anywhere, not just based on a physical thing at a point of sale. The, the industry has moved since then, and mobility has become not something that requires a dongle, but can happen on your phone and does, I think, for most of us every day. Um, this is a place where distribution also really matters. Having 30 million households, in our case, really matters. When we get it right, we can get it right at scale. Mm -hmm. But we have to be very vigilant all the time to make sure that we're either um, engaged in the right uh, conversations, that we're smart about capturing innovation, that, uh, that all of the protections that we talk about and all of the relationships that we talk about don't make us dinosaurs or somehow impervious to the discussion of innovation. So, so it's a balance. And, and when we get beat, when we win, we win fast. Here's a great example. Um, many people would say Bank of America was a little bit slow to market on mobile uh, uh, check deposit, taking, using your phone to take a picture. When we started uh, looking at mobile phone uh, check deposit, the error rates from those photos were over 30%. And we decided that that was a way there we could be fast, but that the customer experience at scale would not be what we wanted to be. So we chose to be a slower follower, mm -hmm. and then speed adoption from there. And today, a huge percentage of our checks are, um, are deposited on a mobile basis and the error rates are extremely low. So we have important trade-offs to make between the quality of the customer experience and the fact that whether it's, um, um, uh, you know, no matter who the provider of the technology is, the experience is tagged to us and tagged to our brand. We have a huge set of complicated, important balances uh, to make and trade off every day. Fair enough, and I think that you have the distribution that allows you to take a little bit more time and be more thoughtful. Um, but let's talk about sort of the speed of Bank of America versus some of the other banks. Um, CB Insights, uh, which is well known to many of us in the room, did a ranking of banks um, with the best fintech portfolios, or the biggest fintech portfolios. Let me just tell you who they put ahead of Bank of America. Goldman, Citi, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, 
Wells Fargo. And they had many more investments, many more partnerships with fintech companies than Bank of America. Um, how does that affect your innovation? How are you making sure that you're seeing the next dongle or the next big thing that's coming so you don't miss out on it? Well, as a company, we don't judge our innovation by, by the number of partnerships we have. We are not a company who's chosen to, to undertake those partnerships based on making investments. What we've found over time is that what brings an entrepreneurial table or player to the table is something that we're better off fostering by buying from them than we are by making them a part of a regulated financial institution. And every company is different. In some cases, it's an acquisition or a partnership where economics are shared and investment is shared. In some cases, it's more of a third party uh, purchase decision. And in places where it's existential, we have got to compete head on with companies that are structured very differently than we are, that don't have uh, um, you know, public shareholders to report to every quarter, that have a capital structure as it relates to, to venture capital that's very different than what our investors expect and that benefit from a regulatory environment that is much less um, uh, prescriptive, that was a nice way of saying it, prescriptive <laughs> than, than ours. So the, the, we, have a, we, we won't ever rank number one on that list. It doesn't mean we don't have a huge portfolio of fintech companies that we work with, uh, with very aggressively and bring to market under our brand every day. I will say you talked to Kathy for a little bit and that definitely comes across. You know, you know your companies down here um, and across the US in terms of innovating. Um, so it's an interesting take because I know here we're going to be talking a lot about partnerships and the M&A strategy, um, digitizing your way to innovation. And there's some debate out on that. But while we do have a few minutes left, I wanted to ask you about something we also talked about earlier that should have got you in trouble this week, but amazingly didn't. <laughs> Let me ask the audience first. Uh, uh, don't. <laughs> who, who's a believer in blockchain technology? Just raise your hand. I believe in blockchain. Yeah, I'm a believer okay, in okay, blockchain. She's a believer. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Kathy's a believer, yes, but you expressed a bit of skepticism earlier this week, which I told you right away, I said it was so refreshing because it's a technology and, you know, a buzz phrase down here that is thrown out so often. And what I think was interesting, you said that you haven't seen one really compelling use case or broad use case that has scaled. Um, I think as, as you know, as you've talked about, we have a tremendous number of patents mm -hmm. in the distributed ledger technology space, 90 patents. Um, I'd, I'd tell you that's more than any other financial institutions, institution, but that's less the point. The point is we're experimenting mm -hmm. and innovative, uh, innovating aggressively. That said, um, we don't see a large number, if any, use cases at scale in financial services for something that tells me that, that distributed ledger tech is, is going to dramatically change the way we do business. Uh, do I hope, I hope, I want it to be successful. I'd like to be better, faster, cheaper. Those are, those are all worthy objectives. And I, I've kind of changed my dialogue. I used to be, I, if I sound defensive, I don't mean to, I used to be very um, uh, protective of, of saying, we we are not um, we don't think it's the we think there's more hype maybe than there is substance for us now I'm more in a throwdown mode mode I'll say to anybody bring me a use case that makes sense and I will look at it I will invest time our organization will invest time but in financial services it's a really tough model. And a lot of companies have put a lot of money and resources into the technology. I think of IBM, right, that rolled out this big announcement in terms of, you know, this shipping partnership, yet they haven't got, you know, enough shipping carriers to sign on with it. So what happens? How does that play out? Companies that have made massive investments, where does it go from here? And I, I think you're not alone in saying you want it to work. It just hasn't, you haven't seen major use cases for it yet. There are industries where there are clear use cases. Shipping, the movement of physical commodities, where the lineage of those commodities, you know, you want to know that you're drinking coffee from the place mm -hmm. on the label that the coffee says it comes from. And the ability to move physical goods and documentation electro with electronic verification at every step along the way, that is an interesting use case. But that's not the business that we're in. Mm -hmm. So, um, so. But it's remarkable that that one is such an obvious and such a needed 
example, yet it has yet to take off. Well, but big, those are the companies and clients that big tech companies serve as well. Mm -hmm. So they're not all in the business just to serve us. They're going to serve a wide range of clients where some of the use cases, I think, are more clear. And on that note, we're out of time. But Kathy, thank you so much. I'm glad that I got a second discussion with you to follow Absolutely. up on this Absolutely. Thanks so much. <laughs>